me to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. I want to speak to you this morning uh, something the Lord put on my heart this week about the glory of God. The glory of God. If you look up the definition of glory in the Scriptures, you will find it means something in its most exalt, exalted condition. If you ever sat in a car that was, you know, been left out in the weather for years, it doesn't run anymore, it's rusted, it's broken down, and it doesn't look anything like what it originally did, but you could just sit in it and you could envision what it must have been like to drive that car and ride in it in its glory, when it smelled brand new, when it shined, when it, when it drove just right. That was the glory of that car. Well, as you read through the Scriptures, you find so much that God has to say about the glory of God. This church has been given promises and prophecies about the glory of God. God said that He was going to consecrate His glory in this house. What does it mean? Well, I I believe it's twofold that we're going to see the glory of Jesus Christ. On Wednesday night, we have been studying the book of Revelation. And you know in chapter 1, when John saw that vision of Christ, and he turned and he saw Jesus and he fell down at His feet as a dead man. He didn't see the Christ that walked around Jerusalem looked, that looked like a peasant or looked like a common man. He didn't see the one from Isaiah 53 that the Bible said he had no form or comeliness that we would desire him. He didn't see the Christ that was beaten and whipped and his back torn apart with a cat of nine tails. And as they ripped the beard out of his face and, or as he laid down and they nailed him to that cross and crucified him on Calvary. Instead, he saw the glorified Christ. John said, I saw him and his face shone like the sun, shining in its strength. He had on a long white robe. He had seven stars in his right hand. His hair was white. Out of his mouth was a two-edged sword. And his, his eyes looked like fire burning out of his eyes. That was a glorified Christ. And the glory of the church... Listen, when was the church glorious? I believe it was most glorious on its birthday, on the day of Pentecost, when God took 120 people that were scared to death, they were common men and women. I I believe if it was today, there would be mechanics and sawmillers and just people from here and there, but people that were desperate for Jesus People that said, I want my life to matter with God. And oh, what it was like to walk with Him. Remember those two disciples on the way to Emmaus that said, Oh, didn't our hearts burn within our chest as we walked and talked with Him in the way. People that wanted to be with Jesus and they're waiting on the promise of the Father. And as they're waiting and tarrying in Jerusalem, the Pentecostal wind began to blow and the Spirit came and fell upon them and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then the one man who denied Jesus three times stood in front of the same crowd that crucified Jesus on that hill and said, listen to me, this same Jesus that you crucified, God has made Him to be both Lord and Christ. And the men were pricked in their heart and said, what must I do? to be saved. 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom that day. Oh, and they didn't join the church and go missing for two weeks, Brother Robert. They met every day breaking bread, continuing to pray and in the apostles' doctrine and they walked with one another. Come what may, persecuted, destroyed, broken down, but they were in the glorious condition of the church. I can tell you what, guys, God wants to restore His church to its real glory. I can tell you what, to to restore something to its exalted condition. I can tell you what, I believe many people in here today, you're walking in the glory of God. God created you for His glory. 
That's why you got these hands right here. I wasn't being funny when I said, get your antennas up. Yes, amen. Because God created your hands to be lifted to Him. I know the church world says just sit there and be silent and don't say nothing. But the Bible says, yes. oh, get your hands on you people and rejoice. David said, let the lifting up of my hands be like the lifting, the evening sacrifice and let my prayer, that means say something, communicate with God. Let my prayer be as incense before thee. That's why God gave you a mouth. Not for cuss words and vile things and to gossip about other people that were made in the likeness and the image of God like you are. But God gave you a mouth to bless Him with. Amen. God gave you a mouth, David said, Thy praise will continuously be in my mouth and I will bless the Lord at all times. God says in Psalms 85, I believe verse 10, when He brought the nation Israel out of bondage, He said, Oh Israel, open wide your mouth. And I will fill it. That's what God created you for. That's why you've got ears. So that you can hear God talk to you. This young man right here. Last night. Said I was praying in that altar. And I heard somebody say I love you. I loved you. I opened my eyes. And nobody was standing. Yes. There around me. I realized it was my father. Yes. Amen. Amen. God's restoring you. To your most exalted condition. To walk with Him in the glory of God. Just imagine somebody picked up one of those old vehicles and they brought it to the shop. And what do they begin to do? They begin to restore it. They begin to restore it. They begin to remove the rust and put on some polish and some paint. And oh, and you ain't going to believe it when He gets done with it. I can tell you what, that's going to be your life. When we get to this, what we're going to read hopefully today, Exodus 33. It's a powerful story. One of, my, one of my most favorite scriptures in all of the Bible. It really brought about the conception of a church called Calvary Chapel. We put the scripture on the door. Where God promised Moses that I'm going to go with you. My presence will be there. And I'm going to give you rest. That promise came after one of the saddest chapters in all of the Word of God. Moses had been up on the mountain with God, seeing a heavenly vision. God called Moses up there in the cloud, in the lightning, and in the thunder. That's all a lot of people saw, was the thunder and the lightning and the noise, and they were afraid. But Moses heard the voice of God drawing him and calling him up higher. And while he was there for 40 days in the mountain with God, he saw a heavenly vision. He was given the Word of God, the commandments of God, which would display to the world the holiness and the might of God. And he was also given a picture of heavenly worship. You know how Moses come down from the mountain and told him how to build the tabernacle, how long and what to do? He saw it in heaven. When he saw the mercy seat, when he saw the seraphim, when he saw the ark of the covenant, it, it didn't come out of Moses' mouth. I saw it in heaven first. Somebody's got to be willing to go and to be with God and hear his voice and bring the instruction and the word of God back to people. But while Moses was caught up with God in the heavens, down in the low place, the devil was infecting and perverting the people of God. If you're not willing to wait on God, what's going to come out of your life every time is a golden calf. They're down there worshiping the golden calf, thanking it like it's what brought them out of Egypt. They're down there, and Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments of God, and he throws them to the ground. A lot of people think that Moses was mad at the people, so he throws the commandment to the ground. But I believe if you really look at it, you understand, if you were to break the law and those stones commandments, it would have been death. God would have had to destroy every single one of those people there. So Moses throws it, and then he begins to intercede. He begins to wrestle yes. with God. God says, get away from these people, Moses. I'm about to consume them. And I'll give you all the promises that I gave to your father Abraham. And Moses took his place right in front of God. And said, God, if you're going to block them out, then block me out. Oh, what a love. What a God made love. God, if you're going to destroy them, then destroy me with them. And God says, Moses, leave me alone so I can be mad. 
didn't believe God until God's anger yes. was cooled. Hallelujah. And there a man stood face to face with God. Let's pick up reading this morning. Exodus 33. And I believe verse 11. The Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he turned again to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Right there, y'all, they're in this place where they're with God. And Moses has been praying and he's been talking to God. But there's a young man in there named Joshua. And Moses is going back to deal with the people. But Joshua said, I ain't leaving. Joshua knew it's not about people. It's about God. I believe that God is raising up a young generation that won't depart out of His presence. That we've had enough of religion. We've had enough of the politics. We've had enough of tradition that keeps people bound and it keeps people dead. Just give me the presence of God. Give me the reality of God. That's where I need to be. I don't come with an agenda. I come with a hunger and a thirst and a need that only Jesus could quench. And Joshua stayed there in the temple. Let's keep reading in verse 12. Moses is talking to God. Moses said to the Lord, See, you said to me, Bring this people up. If you haven't let me know whom you will send with me, yet you say you know me by name and that I have found grace in thy sight. If you look back to verse 2 of this chapter 33, God was saying to Moses, I'm not going to go with you myself because there's sin in that camp and I'm holy and I'll destroy these people. But I'm going to send an angel with you. And just think, y'all, how many people would have been content to just go with an angel, right? We've got an angel in our camp. We've got an angel in our group. That's amazing. That's better than what a lot of people got. We, we've got this angel we can go with and just be entertained by the angel. But Moses wasn't going to settle for an angel. Look in verse 13. He said, I pray thee if I found grace in thy sight, Show me now thy way. I, I don't want to know about an angel. Amen. I want to know your way. Amen. I want to walk with you. I don't want it to be second hand. I, I just want to know your way. That I may know you. That I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. That's what God says to most. That I'm my people, God. They're your people. And as he was interceding and praying for the people, he said, God, what will the Egyptians say if you destroy them right here? You didn't bring them out of Egyptian bondage to kill them at the base of Mount Sinai, God. You brought them out to take them into a land flowing with milk and honey. What are the Egyptians going to say if you don't get them there, if you're not able to bring them through? And God was jealous for His glory. Understand, God has given you, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 says that God has given you exceeding and great precious promises and God has attached His name to you. To the world it means nothing. The promises that are in this book, to the people of God though, those promises are precious, they're real, they're valid, and we need to walk in them and remind ourselves of them and remind God of them. God, remember you promised me. God, remember your word. It's not that God forgets. It's that God responds and He looks for faith. Amen. Don't just sit back and say, well, God's going to do it. No, God responds to faith. God responds to people that are desperate. God responds to people that believe. Moses is pleading with God and said, when I met with you at the burning bush, you didn't tell me nothing about an angel. You told me you would be with me. And look what God says in verse 14. My presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. That's all you need. That's all you need. You don't need an angel. You don't need a bunch of money or a huge crowd of friends. All you need 
is the presence of God. I'm going to go with you. Not another, but me. I'll be there with you and I will give you rest. That means when the load gets heavy and you want to quit, He'll carry you. That means when you feel like I've been stretched to the limits and I'm about to lose it, He will carry you. He'll be your strength. When you can't go any further, Jesus will carry you. My presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. I love verse 15. Moses said to him, if you're present, go not with me. Carry us not a pinch. Pretty much this. If you ain't going, I ain't going either. Amen. Right? If God ain't in it, you don't want to be in it either. Amen. But if God is in it, you need to press on. You need to carry on through. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in your sight? Is it not that you go with us? That's how you know that you found grace from God. Is that He's with you. That's His presence. That's the witness of the Spirit. Romans 8 says that His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Or oh, if people ask you if you're saved and you say, I think so, I hope so, maybe so, that ain't good enough. You've got an appointment where you're going to stand with this God. I'm here to tell you today, you can know that you know that you know that you've been born again and you're name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. And you don't have to wait till that day to experience God. You can experience Him every day. That's what grace has afforded us. Look in verse 17. The Lord said to Moses, this thing will I do what you've spoken. Because you found grace in my sight and I know you by name. And Moses said, I beseech thee, I beg thee, show me that's what I want to see. I want to see you in your most exhaust, exalted condition. I want to see you, God, in your glory. I want to see you in your splendor. I want to see you in your strength. And listen to what God says in verse 19. I will make all of my goodness pass before you. That's how you know you're walking in the glory of God. Doesn't mean your life's without trouble or problems. That's not what we're saying. But I told a man in this altar this morning, in six months you're going to look back on your life and you ain't going to believe what God has done in your heart and in your life. That's the glory He made His goodness pass over you. He put His hand on you. He protected you. He fought for you. It could have went bad, but it went good because it's the goodness of God that He's caused to pass over your life. He said, I will pro proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Listen, God's name is tied to covenant. You know, the Bible says that you shouldn't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That doesn't just mean a cuss word. A construction worker spills out when he hit his hammer, his thumb with a hammer. Taking the Lord's name in vain is like two people getting married and she takes his name but she's not faithful to Him. You took His name, but you're not faithful. You took His name and you made vows, but you're not doing what you said you would do. God's name is tied to covenant. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's your healer. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's the Lord, your provider. He's whatever you need Him to be. God's name is tied to covenant. I'll tell you my name. I'll tell you my name. I'll tell you. I can tell you what all those names point to. The name Jesus Christ. King of kings and Lord of lords. Fairest of ten thousand. The one name under heaven. Spoken by men whereby we must be saved. He's saying to you, Moses, I'm going to let my goodness pass before you. And I'm going to declare the name of the Lord to you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. That's what God's glory does. That's why God wants to restore you to an exalted condition. You know what that exalted condition is? Seated with Christ in heavenly places. Not down here in the low place with the, in a, just always grumbling, always complaining. Old glass is always half empty and I'm always the victim and all that kind of... That's, more, that's Egypt talk. We're going to the land of milk and honey. We're going where we don't cry over spilled milk. We're going where we build people up instead of tearing people down. God says, I'm going to be gracious with the people.
people I'll be gracious to and I'll show mercy to whom I'll show mercy. And he said, you can't see my face because nobody can see me. That's how strong God's glory is. <laughs> oh, I'm going to show you the best I can, Moses, but that body you got right now, it can't take what I've got. It, it, I'll give you a little bit, but if I, I think Moses' head would have popped off if he would have saw God in His fullness, in His most exalted condition. But God says there's a place by me and you'll stand on a rock somewhere and there is Jesus. Right by Him, right at the Father's right hand on a rock. And He said it will come to pass that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to hide you, Moses, within the rock. I'm going to cover you with my hand while I pass by. And while I take away my hand, you'll see my back parts. But my face shall not be seen. The title of this this morning comes from verse 18. Show me thy glory. You know, that was Moses' prayer. Lord, I'm walking by faith. By faith, I've gotten this far. I'm a, I'm a man that was just a shepherd, nobody, just a few days ago. And by faith, I walked into Egypt and told the mightiest man I ever met to let your people go. He chased us all the way to the Red Sea and we thought that we were going to die there that day. But right in the nick of time, you took the staff and Stacy, you were right on this morning. Huh? That I spent 40 years chasing sheep around in the desert and I thought God forgot about me. I thought I missed my moment. But instead, those 40 years of brokenness were preparing me when I'd take that stick and lift it over that ocean and you would make a wall of water on each side and dry land in the middle. And I got to walk in front of three million Israelites in the presence and the glory of God. And as we walked through and we got on the other side, we watched that highway collapse. Oh, and the people that tormented me and mocked me and beat me all of my life. We watched our God destroy them and get victory over them in the midst of the Red Sea. And I've just been walking by faith. And God, you brought me right here to the base of Mount Sinai. And you're telling me that we're going to go to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I was just gone for 40 days. Just 40 days and these people, God, you saw what they did. Now I need you to show me your glory. You ever been there in your life, God, I just need you to give me something. I need you to, I know it's a wicked and adulterous generation that looks for a son. But God, I just need you, I need you to cause your goodness to pass over me just for a moment. I've been living by faith. I've been walking, trusting you and I, I just need to see something to know that you're with me. I need you to show me that I'm not crazy or that I haven't lost my mind, but that I really heard from you and I, I really heard your voice. I can remember not long after I had gotten saved, I was still dealing with some shame and guilt from my old life, and I felt like God was calling me, but I was scared. And, and some people, it, it doesn't matter what you do right, they're always going to remember what you did wrong. And I, I was really wrestling with that, man. My heart was so on fire for God. And you know, somebody was saying, maybe last night, I had a lot of in and outs in my life. In church and then I'm out of church. Preaching and then I'm partying with the world. And really struggled to follow the Lord. Especially when I was younger, young teenager. You know, just dealing with the shame and the guilt of that. But, you know, I knew what God had done in my life this time. It's, I'm not going back. I would pray and I still pray. God burn every bridge behind me. There's no hope of returning to that old life. I'm either going to press on with God or I'm going to die right here. But going back to Egypt is not an option for me. I'm going on with you. And I was in the floor at my house in the trailer that we lived in and I was reading the, the story of the prodigal son, how he came home. And the father threw his arms around him and put a robe on him and shoes on his feet and a ring on his hand. And he said, kill the fatted calf. Let's have a celebration. 
And I knew that in the story, what God was doing, the reason there was a celebration and a robe and shoes and a ring and a happy time, it was to break the shame that was on that young man as he come home from the pig pen. God has shown me that sin may last just for a few minutes, but the shame can endure for a lifetime. And the devil will drown you in the shame of what you did 15 years ago until you learn what the blood of Jesus to wash away all guilt and shame of the past. That's what I said. Laying in that floor that day, God, you got to show me. What's that mean to me? How are you going to break this shame off of my life? Right about that time, I'm in that floor seeking God. And a little old, maybe about a two-year-old boy came coming down the hallway calling out for a fellow named Daddy. I'm dead. <laughs> he come calling out to me and God showed me. So that's the fatted calf. That's the lifting of shame in your life. I'm going to give you a family that the glory of God is going to shine upon and shine in. And I'm going to cause them to go further with me than you ever dreamed about. And every time I see these children at this altar worshiping and praying and, and God filling them with His Spirit and shining in the glory of God, that's what I see. I see the fatted calf. I see my inheritance. I see the lifting off of shame. Because if God can do it in my house, He can do it anywhere and in anybody. Show me your glory. God, I've been in Egypt for all of my life. I don't know anything about it. Show me that glory. God, I've been a slave and I've spent all my life toting bricks for an Egyptian. you got to show me your glory. God, I've been addicted to drugs for so long. You've got to show me your glory. God, I've lived in sin for so long. You've got to show me your glory. God, I've been in a pit for a couple years now. And I lost my joy and I lost my first love. And I, I believe in you and I believe in your word, but I'm down and I'm low. You've got to show me. Show me your glory. Show me that it's not too late for me. Show me that the locust and the canker worm haven't destroyed the best years of my life. God, I've failed you so many times. And I've been in and I've been out and I've been up and I've been down and I've played the hypocrite and I've played the harlot and I've played the fool. God, you've got to show me your glory. That's what Moses is praying in the midst of this desert at the base of of Mount Sinai. Look at this scripture this morning. Just going to go and might have to get a part two one of these days. But look at this in 1 Kings chapter 10. Talk to you about the glory of God. If there was a king in Israel that saw God's glory, it was Solomon. Solomon was King David's son. There are times when I think that Solomon, in some ways, was a type of Christ because the glory, 1 Kings chapter 10, because his kingdom was great, it was beyond measure, it was beyond wealth. And people would come from far and wide. Other kings and queens would come to hear the wisdom of Solomon. They would come from a long way. That's the king of kings. That's the Lord of Lords. Other times I believe Solomon is really a picture of the church. Because when people saw the greatness of the kingdom of Solomon, they knew it had to be a great God who did it for him and made it possible. Look at verse 16. 1 Kings 10, 16. King Solomon made 200 targets. This is armor. Some type of armory of beaten gold. And 600 shekels of gold went into one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. And three pounds of gold went into one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. And the throne had six steps. At the top of the throne was round behind. And there were staves that's like hands on either side on the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the staves of the hands. 
And twelve lines stood on one side, and on the other side, uh, upon the six steps, and there was not the like made in any kingdom. That's the throne Solomon sitting on. Nobody's got one like that. Nothing could compare to Solomon. Listen to verse 21. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were gold. The vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon, that's where he lived, were pure gold. And none were of silver, for it was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. Silver meant nothing. They wasted silver. If you had silver, you was poor. Everything Solomon had, everything he touched, it's made out of gold. Gold speaks of deity. It speaks of the heavens. It speaks of purity. And it speaks of the kingdom of God. Verse 22, the king had at sea a navy of Tarsus.